no sweets, only ripe vegetables, fresh fruit and whole wheat. I'm from the old school, my household smell like soul food, bro. Hello and welcome to episode three of The Bearded Vegans. I'm Paul. And I'm Andy. And we are The Bearded Vegans, a podcast featuring a dissection of all things vegan. If you're just tuning in for the first time, you can find all of our previous episodes on The Commentist Network at thecommentist.com. And of course, you can always reach us by emailing us at thebeardedvegans at gmail.com. And we love to receive mail. (laughs) In today's... That we do. In in today's mini episode, we will be jumping right into a discussion of Unity, the newest film by Earthlings director Sean Monson. Think of now what the universe is. Millions of galaxies. And among those galaxies is our little planet. For it is here, and only here, that we are working out our destiny. We all exist in the same atmosphere. Why then do we separate and distinguish? Plot synopsis. For Unity, according to IMDb, despite the advent of science, literature, technology, philosophy, religion, and so on, none of these uh, has assuaged uh, humankind from killing one another, the animals, and nature. Unity is a film about why we can't seem to get along even after thousands and thousands of years. And as mentioned, this is the follow-up to the film Earthlings, and we learned through a little slideshow before the film that Unity was seven years in the making, and it features over 100 celebrity narrators. And, of course, the list is you know too long to read here, but uh, Casey Affleck, Pamela Anderson, uh, Deepak Chopra, Common, David Copperfield, Ellen DeGeneres, Dr. Dre. The list goes on and on. A lot of actors, a couple of athletes, a couple of philosophical thinkers, mm-hmm. and a few other people sprinkled throughout, including uh, John Paul, the uh, salon guy <laughs> yeah i did not catch that <laughs> <laughs> um so anyway so yeah it's a, it's a huge spread of celebrities and people which i'm sure are designed to sort of bring people into the movie and before we dive into talking about unity i think it's necessary that we address our feelings on the film earthlings so paul have you seen the film earthlings yes yes i have all um, right i saw it i saw it after i went vegan but pretty pretty soon after i went vegan so i was kind of like a fresh vegan when i saw it and um it was i thought earthlings was incredibly powerful i thought it was well made and i immediately tried to show my family and and i encouraged a lot of my friends to try and watch it because i thought it was um it was a movie that just was exposing the truth of what was out there in a way that being a new vegan, I didn't really know all the facts of everything that was going on, such as in factory farming, in factory farms. So I thought it was a great resource tool. And even though I haven't seen it in um, probably five years, I still would recommend people to watch it that either are vegetarian, even people that are newly vegan, because it gives them kind of the resource and the facts and statistics and anecdotes to talk about uh, these issues with non-vegans or uh, vegetarian, non-vegetarians. So, yeah, I really liked Earthlings. I thought it, 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 had a great, um, it had a great message, and I still do. And it was one of the two movies that has ever made me cry, <laughs> the other being uh, The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise. Because <laughs> you are a burnt-out husk of a man who <laughs> cannot be moved by any film, apparently. <laughs> uh, I, on the other hand, often cry at films. I'm like a sucker for films that make me cry. What did you think of Earthlings? Yeah, so I also didn't see Earthlings until I went vegan, and I actually didn't watch it in its entirety until a couple of years into being vegan. I tried to watch it maybe six months to a year into being vegan originally, and after about 30 minutes, I was like, I'm going to turn this off. I'm already on the team. I don't (laughs) need to see this. It's just going to make me feel horrible. And then a few years later, I was hanging out with someone who was really interested in going vegan. And then they finally were like, I- I'm ready. Like, show me the way. And so I drove down and I brought Forks Over Knives and I brought Earthlings. And now I would add c- Cowspiracy to that mix because that's another huge chunk of the picture. And I was like, all right, I've never seen this in its entirety, but I will watch the whole thing and never turn away if you do as well. And we did. And it, it made me feel horrible. It yeah. just... 
instilled a rage inside of me that um, is good for uh, renewing your commitment to helping animals. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe not so good in in helping you become an effective advocate because I I find that when you have to be effective, you sort of have to turn off that emotion part of your brain of being too angry about what's going on because, of course, the film is very disturbing. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's my feelings on Earthlings. I think it's a monumental film. I, I think it's a must watch for literally any person living on the planet. Yep. Because it is so all encompassing of of the experience of animals on this planet. So it seems like we're both on the same page there as far as, as how great the film Earthlings is and, and how important it is. So of course there was a huge hype build up to Unity and very very long in the works. So do you feel that Unity lived up to that hype? Um, and before I answer this question, I do want to say that Andy and I did see the movie together and we refrained from talking about it until this podcast. Okay. And also, can we, uh, this is just a small thing, but um, there was supposed to be a Q&A after the film and, and then uh, like a pre-taped Q&A from the LA premiere. And the theater just kind of turned off the <laughs> film and a bunch of people were standing around like, what are we supposed to do? So I wish we could have seen that to get a little more insight into the filmmaker's motivations and the process of the film. But we did not see that. Yeah. And uh, also the film started with no sound <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of like grumpy people staring at the projectionist booth as if that would do something. Uh, so they had to like pause it and rewind it. So our, our viewing experience was a little bit interrupted. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your what was your question? Just oh, your thoughts on it. Okay. Well, I I definitely didn't think it was as focused and as uh I don't think this is a word, but impactful as That's a word. I think that's a word. Okay, cool. I don't think it was as focused and impactful as Earthlings and I I think that in trying to cover a message and a topic that is so huge it just became the movie just became too huge and too unfocused and not specific enough. And, uh, a lot of the kind of really good points that the movie did have, I felt were kind of lost in this, this kind of huge idea that they were trying to convey. That's my, that is my, my over like huge general impression of the movie. That's my first impression at least. Uh, did you have something similar or <laughs> yeah well so um when i reflect back on earthlings and what i did and didn't like about earthlings um the the part of earthlings that i didn't like was sort of that the 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 bookends the intro narration the closing narration by joaquin phoenix it always felt like it went on for way too long and it just kind of <clears throat> feels like this meaningless jargon and unfortunately th- to me, that's what this entire film was. It felt like the introduction to another film, and it never quite got to the core of any of the ideas that it was trying to explore. Mm-hmm. And so, personally, I like to I see about one or two films in the theater every week. So I love going to the theater. I love having that experience, and and I prefer, if possible, to go in without knowing too much about films, just so I can be surprised. So if I, I know I like the director or an actor or something, I'm can avoid the trailer. So I did the same thing with this. I knew that there was all these narrators, Mm -hmm. but I knew literally nothing else about the film. And it goes about saying, we're going to spoil the hell out of this film. (laughs) There's not really much to spoil, I guess, but if if you are just looking for a a quick review or something, uh, this is not the place for it. So we're going to discuss the film in depth. Um, it, it was it's kind of just a collection of clips it felt like there was not very much original footage being shot for if any yeah um, the stuff that may have been original footage also could have just been some stock footage that is purchased from you know some stock footage place yeah, yeah. and so it's uh there's this swelling dramatic music over the entire thing, which makes it just feel like the introduction of something mm-hmm. like it, you you're, it's like you're waiting for this to settle down and then really focus in on something. And for me personally, initially I was like, Oh, the hundred narrators is a good hook. Obviously that's going to get a lot of people that probably wouldn't check it out. It's like, 
okay, you got Jeff Goldblum and you have Dr. Dre. And, you know, it's like, okay, you have all these people. Um, and that's going to bring in a lot of people to check out this very important message. And I actually found that incredibly distracting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, it was all in subtitles, which is great because that makes it accessible. But they also put up the, um, you know, the narrator's name and a picture. Yeah. Every time they come up, which is probably good because <laughs> otherwise you're sitting there going like, is that Aaron Paul? Like, you, you, you're not sure. Um, but it was just so like I, I wasn't looking at the images on yeah. the screen. I was just yeah. looking and waiting because they change a narrator every two or three lines. So I, f- I found that just so distracting. And um, it also made me start to pay attention to what types of people they had narrating. Mm-hmm. And that became incredibly distracting. And I'd like to talk about the film's um, handling of race a little bit later on. Mm-hmm. But from my count, there's 15 people of color out of a hundred different actors or, or narrators. Yeah. And it's a film about unity <laughs> and they're showing tons of footage of people around the world. Um, but it's mostly these white American and British uh, narrators for the most part. So it just felt a little off in that regard. So uh, that's a whole, whole lot of word vomit from me, but that I, I, I think I really, I don't know if I'd say hate, but I wanted to walk out. There was two people that walked out about 20 or 30 minutes in, and I wish I could have gone with them. If it wasn't for this podcast, I feel like I, I would have gone because I felt like this was a waste of time. And yeah. it pains me to say that because I was pulling for this movie so hard. Obviously, we want it to be huge because it's the follow-up to Earthlings. Yeah, yeah. Um, I totally agree. The the sub like. I'll, like when I watch them, sometimes I do have to watch movies with subtitles just because it's hard to understand the the actors and actresses. But even when I do that, it's it's like a little distracting, and I I find myself just reading the subtitles, like looking at the bottom of the screen, waiting for the subtitles instead of actually looking at what's going on. And now with the added pictures and the names of the the actors and actresses. And every time, like a famous, well, they're all famous, but every time someone that I knew would come up, I'd start thinking about them and like all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, and it's like the, since it's not really a movie that's like, it, I, I guess it has a plot. It's a, but it's not in, not in a traditional sense. We should dig into that. <laughs> Do we think it actually has a thesis and is it following that thesis in the form of a plot? But let me, let me finish by said this first, like, because it maybe doesn't have a plot. It's like the movie relies so heavily on the images that it's showing. And these subtitles and pictures are taking a, for me, they were like distracting me from that, which is like the main point of the movie. And, and there's times when they need um, a, I, I guess subtitles, not the right word. Cause there's subtitles for narration, but a, a, not a title card, but an additional set of text so this uh, to describe, oh, this is so and so lab test. This is a war that's yeah. happening here. This is a police beating happening here. So there's times when you have the narration text at the <laughs> bottom and this other block of text at the top, and you're trying to read yeah. both of them. And it's like, yeah, no matter how much I tried to focus in on the center of the screen, my eyes are just like, what's this thing that's going on down here? <laughs> and so it, it just. I don't know if maybe they didn't have the pictures. It would have been a little bit easier to follow along and, and separate those things. And, and again, I think it's great to, to have the subtitles so it's accessible to so many mm-hmm. other people. Um, but just so much text on the screen, just yeah. it, I felt totally lost and I yeah. just zoned out. And uh, going back quickly to something you said before, that it was a lot of borrowed images and videos. And that kind of bummed me out too because I mean they, uh, like I we also went with my dad and um, when I was talking about it with him before this podcast obviously uh, when I was talking about it with him he said one of the most powerful clips for him was when they um, when they cooked and served the fish that was still alive that was rough which is like terrible I've already I've seen that video before and I've seen a lot of the other video, like like you said, they're kind of like they're not stock videos, but they're videos that have circulated the internet before. And um, I mean, they are totally powerful. They're still powerful. They're still horrible and disgusting. But um, it, I wish that there was. Uh, I, I was going to say I wish that there was like new footage that I hadn't seen. But at the same time, I guess in a movie that's trying to document things that have happened in the past and are happening, you do kind of have to use some. So I just changed my mind in the middle of that little <laughs> ramble, but I guess you do have to use some of the same images. I think it's possible to have it both ways, to, to wish for new footage. Not that you know we want new and horrible things to happen to animals yeah. just so a film can happen. 
Um, but it, yeah, it did feel like, okay, this is a lot of stuff I've seen before. You know, and I was trying to say, okay, well, this film's not for me because I'm on board with a lot of, or at least I thought and initially that I was on board with what the film was going to be presenting to me. How would someone who's never been exposed to this stuff receive it? And they probably haven't seen some of this footage mm-hmm. or most of this footage before, although a lot of it is just... Uh, the animal footage, I think maybe more people have seen less of that. A lot of it is just war footage, protest footage, mm-hmm. police beating footage, um, famine footage, stuff that people are... I'm assuming very well familiar with. Um, and with the use of the music, I thought that actually took away from some of the footage. And we had this unique experience. I, as I mentioned, the, the, the sound didn't start for the beginning of the film. Also talking about the beginning of the film, it's like they have like a quote and then like the title card. And then they have like scrolling text (laughs) from Les Mis. And it was just like, okay, pick a way to start this film. And the opening footage is some of the saddest, but least graphic footage Mm -hmm. uh, out there, which is, I'm sure a lot of people listening have seen this. It's two cows in a chute waiting to um, be slaughtered or get the captive bolt gun on the other side of this uh, door. And one cow goes in and dies, and the other cow realizes what's going to happen to them. So they're struggling to escape, and then eventually they go in. And we started watching it with no sound whatsoever. And it was actually this very solemn moment, I thought, very impactful, where you're sort of reflecting on this cow. And you can't hear them struggling in the way that you can when the sound was on. But when the sound was on, they rewound it, played it again for us. We had to watch this horrible thing all over again. They had this big swelling music over it as if to be like, you should feel really sad about this (laughs) when we already know we should feel sad about this. And just that the loneliness and isolation of that cow is already felt so strongly in the video. They didn't need this constant barrage of sad melodramatic music. And I think looking back on it, that might have been one of the longest clips that they played, too. It was probably two, two minutes I would guess maybe longer. Yeah. I felt like four maybe, but yeah. And I think that there needed to be more clips like that. It was a lot of like, boom, 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 picture, 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 two second video clip, two second video clip. And there wasn't a lot of like, okay, we're going to like stop talking for a second and just let something happen. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, adding that on top of the text that you have to read sometimes on two parts of the screen, with that plus constantly changing images, sometimes images change once or twice before that line of text even goes away. You don't have time to sort of read that line real quick. Cause to me, that's when I'm looking at, you know, subtitles, it's like, I kind of read that line really fast and then I look up and I see the actor catching up with the speech and I'm able to sort of take in, um, mm-hmm. you know, what's happening. And this was sort of like, you're looking and trying to go back and forth, up and down, <laughs> trying to, trying to take it all in. And it just, it was really hard to absorb. So, uh, so let, we, we briefly mentioned a plot, and I think that um, as I was watching it, <laughs> I'm trying to, for, I'm, I'm like shaking with how much this movie didn't resonate with me. <laughs> um, I was trying to think, what is this film saying about these issues? Does it bring anything new to the table? Is this something we haven't heard before? Or if this is someone that's new to this issue, is it being presented in a way that really breaks it down and carries the viewer along this journey of, you know, presenting this idea or this, we're all earthlings and then this, and we should do this. Um, do you feel like the film effectively conveyed any ideas? What do you think was the main overall message of the film? So I, to answer one of your questions, no, I don't think it was effective. <laughs> um, it, it, to me, it, it just kind of had these like, it's funny because when you just said it sounded like it, it felt like the intro or the outro to a movie, I did not realize it, but that is exactly what it felt like. And it, it was just it just kept presenting these these really these good philosophies, but it kind of I don't know it. I, I, a lot of the time when I was watching it, I was thinking about the person writing it, and I felt like they were sitting there and thinking like, how can I make this idea sound as complex as possible? And so they were presenting good philosophies about about well unity and how um treating like treating each other with love and and ending war and so on and they're good philosophies they're philosophies that i think we should think about but 
I just think that they, they were trying so hard to make them like so complex. And the fact that it was an hour and a half of straight talking, there's no way that anyone could not lose focus at some point. So I lost focus a lot. And then I would come back in and I'd be like, I have no idea what they're talking about right now. So I, like I said, I think they had good ideas and good messages, but um, they just weren't that effective. And something that really bummed me out is that what I took from the movie is something that I already knew. And that's the world is a pretty messed up place. And even <laughs> on the car at home, my dad, who um, doesn't really swear that much, he's just like, he turns to me, he's like, yeah, the world's pretty fucked up. <laughs> and, um, and it's something that, I mean, I already knew. I already knew that all these issues existed. And this movie kind of like solidified that, that knowledge for me, that the world is a pretty messed up place. But what really bummed me out is that it left me feeling like, all right, I'm, I'm all, I'm, I'm, so furious about all this stuff now what can i do and the movie just didn't give me any <laughs> outlets like i'm i'm already vegan i know that that doesn't make me like perfect it doesn't make me a perfect vegan it doesn't mean i can't live more compassionately with like the, how how the way i eat or in other ways but it's like i'm already vegan and i'm already i try to be kind to other people so it's like that's really all that the movie kind of suggests that you do and and that's unfortunately just doing that isn't really good. It's going to have some impact on the world, but it's not going to change the world. And I really wish that the movie gave me some outlets. And I know it would not have fit in with the narration and like how they were always speaking like in these complexities and with this philosophical tone, it wouldn't have fit in to be like, Oh, and you can go and do this or you can try doing this or you can write to your local Congress person and like do, do attend protests. It wouldn't have fit in with how the film felt, but I think that it would have been more effective. And it's like now, if this movie is successful in changing people's minds, which I'm not even sure that if I already didn't, if I already wasn't vegan or wasn't kind to other people, I don't know that this movie would make me be those things. But even if it did, if it did make me change, then I would have felt like, okay, my work here is done and I have nothing else to do. <laughs> and then for someone that already is kind or already is vegan, it's kind of like, okay, I'm doing these things. The world is still really messed up. And what can I do now? And it, and it doesn't really give me any outlet. Absolutely. <laughs> I've, I've, I feel you on that. I think that... I felt that very hard, which is the uh, the idea of a conclusion to the film. And I think that the most successful documentaries are the ones that very methodically break down an issue, explain what it is, explain why it's bad, and it, then explain that there's hope for changing it. And then there's always that last, you know, five, ten minutes where the music gets happier. And it's like, <laughs> these are people that are doing something about it. These are people that are doing something about it. Here's what you can do about it. Now let's get out there and change the world. And, you know, we know that often that motivation is short lived, but it's also like you, you sort of need that. And this film didn't give you any sense of closure or, um, you know, overarching message. Like, um, you know, if I had to reflect on what I thought the points of the film were, it was war is bad. Yep. You can get protein from plants. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of it. Like, yeah. I guess be nice to people. But, um, I mean, the... The opening of the film where I just sort of immediately lost me after they play the footage of the cow and then do the title sequence. And Joaquin Phoenix. And Joaquin Phoenix <laughs> introducing the film. Twice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there was two. It's, yeah, yeah, there's like three or four introductions to this film with text and Joaquin Phoenix does this thing. And I'm sure that'll only be for the, this one time theater yeah. showing, but he like speaks, uh, I'm excited to present this and it fades to black and then he comes back on and he's like, oh, and also there's going to be a Q&A and a that it fades back. Why couldn't they just redo it in one take? <laughs> It was just ridiculous. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, you spent seven years on this and, and you couldn't, yeah, go back and retake this. It wasn't like he was, he was in a different seat. He was same shirt, same chair. Like, it was ridiculous. Um, and so I, I felt like, yeah, it, it seemed like someone was really satisfied with themselves for writing this very complex kind of pseudo mumbo jumbo new wave jargon stuff. 
and really it, it felt like something that like an eighth grader or something was like just beginning to have any sort of sense of rage at the world. Uh, you know, I feel like most people, myself included, when you sort of have some kind of sense of injustice in the world and your first thing is that the government is bad and war is bad and it, it almost felt like it just kind of went that far yeah. and didn't go any further and it's like okay maybe you read a couple philosophy books and you're throwing some stuff in there and okay you got Deepak to to do like three lines in your <laughs> film um, you know and it sucks and I, I hate to, to trash this thing because again so much respect for Sean Monson and yeah. Earthlings uh, it just feels like really missed the mark here and it, it yeah, just it feels like it had literally nothing to say. Like it, it felt like it thought it had something to say, but didn't have anything to say. Certainly didn't have anything new to say. And the only time that I felt like it was sort of really focusing in on a specific issue was animals. And I was expecting the film to sort of and in in the opening slideshow that was just sort of while you're sitting down, some trivia plays and whatnot was saying it was supposed to be a six-part miniseries, and instead they had to, due to budget, chop it down to 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was expecting, okay, here's 15 minutes on animals, and here's 15 minutes on global hunger and war, and here's 15 minutes on environmental destruction, something of that nature, and here's why all of these things are connected and why you should care about all of them. And it all was just this super incredibly vague, cosmic, we are all one part of the stardust, the nebula <laughs> thing. And then all of a sudden it was like, did you know you can get protein from plants? <laughs> and, it, and then it makes an argument about, it really zeroed in on dairy uh, and was like, you know, we're the only species that drinks milk past infancy, let alone the milk of another species, which is like a good point. Mm -hmm. from a health perspective, but I feel like that argument kind of falls thin from a philosophical perspective because also we are wearing glasses and we're in a house and it's like where there's a lot of things that humans do that they also trashed. They trashed wearing glasses. Okay. So (laughs) I, I hate people that take out their phones in the theater, but I had to take out my phone on the lowest dimness and I was like writing little notes because I didn't want to forget that. Um, yeah, the, the section on animals. All right. I'm just taking my phone for my notes and I see Amanda who just saw it has seven messages. So I'm sure she hated it as well. The, The section on health and you know, they really trash obesity obesity and heart disease and all that stuff. I mean, I guess you should trash heart disease, but uh, <laughs> it's not anyone's you, friend. Heart disease. Exactly. It's not anyone's friend. Also, this is definitely not a mini episode. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry if you thought this was going to be 20 minutes long, but yeah, so they make the argument that, uh, well, you don't see obese animals and you don't see animals with glasses and hearing aids. And it's like, well, there are deaf animals and there are blind animals. So it's like th- I mean, there are certain aspects of it. Okay, yeah. you don't see these degenerative diseases in animals. Okay, but like trashing like glasses and hearing aids where it's like you don't see a tiger with glasses. Yeah. It's like there's probably tigers with vision problems. <laughs> like we're not out there checking every yeah. tiger's vision problem. Yeah. It just seemed like such a weird conclusion to make. And if I was someone coming in that wasn't vegan and wasn't like, I mean, even as a vegan, I was like, that doesn't make any sense. (laughs) If I was coming in as not a vegan, I'd be like, this is the best vegans have. Like, they're going to argue that goats don't have hearing aids. Like, it it was just so upsetting to think that, like, and that was the only time when the film was like, here's an issue and here's what you can do. You can stop eating animals. You can get your protein from plants. And then they, yeah, they cycle back around to that fish Wait, I hadn't seen that specific fish footage, um, yeah. but I had seen a different footage, uh, a different footage of uh, a fish being eaten while alive. Mm-hmm. There's, it's just, it's horrific and it's yeah. heartbreaking. And and I will say, if I may interrupt, that that was another Please. scene um, that was a lengthy clip. It was. I don't, I'm so bad at judging time, but maybe two, two, three minutes when again, every other clip was five seconds long. And again, that was one of the most powerful scenes in the whole movie. Yes, uh, absolutely. And, um, and someone else also left during that scene. I don't know if she went to the bathroom is pretty late in the thing, but she like seemed like she was upset and got up and then had to come back a little while later. Um, but she kind of like whispered to her friend. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, so that was that was difficult, and um, I'm just going to put this kernel in the conversation. We can circle back around to it. Yep. Um, I think we should discuss which clips they showed 
uh, and choose not to show and where specifically they were sort of portraying these horrible things happening versus where they might not have been portraying them. That's kind of cryptic, but I just want to lay that on the table now. Uh, I'm sorry, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say, I'll make this quick. Just a, a little bit of comic relief uh, for this otherwise pretty <laughs> morbid podcast. But um, one part that Andy and I both laughed at was when the guy <laughs> eats the hamburger and then it just like freeze frames on him and is like, dun dun. <laughs> and, and the whole screen goes to like gray. Yeah. And it's like super dramatic. Just like a bad like 2020 report or something. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah. um, and also the other moment that I laughed, I don't know if you heard me when I whispered it to you, David Copperfield. I'm a fan of. <laughs> magic yeah. he he was like there is no this there is no that and i was like it's all an illusion and then the next line was like yeah. it's just an illusion yeah. and i was like come on that's too on the nose yeah. okay yeah. did you have any other thoughts on that section or can i no move on Let's okay move on. all right so we we've talked about this a little bit this is something that i took uh took some notes on uh i think the portrayal of race in the film i found like to be super problematic um, like I said, the lack of people of color as narrators was like noticeable, like yes. to the point where I was like, there hasn't been a person of color in the first 20 minutes of the film mm-hmm. or something. And it's like, I knew Dr. Dre was coming on cause they had a little title card saying he was <laughs> the first person to say yes to the film. Yep. And, um, common was on quite a bit, but maybe that was like the director being like, all right, we need to put Common in there a bunch of times and maybe people will think that it's a different person of color. Also, Common said the word Common. I don't know if you caught that. (laughs) (laughs) I just wanted to be like, nudge your arm. It's like when the character says the title of the film or something. Um, And yeah, I, you know, so I counted 15. Mm -hmm. Like, it was just so noticeable that I started keeping track on my hands. And there may have been a few more. There's a couple of people I didn't recognize and I wasn't sure, you know, uh, what, where they came from Mm -hmm. or, or, uh, you know, what their background is, I should say. Um, So uh, maybe bump it up to 20, but that's like 20% (laughs) out of, you know, it's like this film that's talking about the unity of the world and all this stuff. And they're showing plenty of footage of things that are happening to and by people of color. Um, but the film, uh, something I was really worried about and seemed to kind of come true was that it was just this like sort of color blind. We're all one. Mm-hmm. We all bleed the same blood <laughs> message, which, yeah. which, uh, you know, for, for those listening, it's like there's a colorblind racism is a thing where it's like, you know, people are saying, well, I don't see color and you kind of erase people's experiences and you know, you're sort of denying the fact that some people have advantages mm-hmm. and so people have disadvantages and, and racism and institutionalized racism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Um, and it just felt like a huge film for people, for like white people to watch and be like, yeah, like all you people of color just need to become one yeah. and peaceful oh, like definitely. us. Cause so much of the footage was like, th- there's plenty of footage of horrible stuff that white people were doing, but it was like a lot of look at these horrible things. And you know, the stuff with the animals, um, you know, there's obviously what happened to the fish is horrible, but, you know, hearkening back to other episodes, uh, all two of them, we <laughs> talked about like the Yulin Dog Festival and, you know, all these campaigns that aim to sort of be like, hey, you other people in this mm-hmm. other country that we view as foreign and weird, you need to change what you're doing instead of saying, hey, there's a lot of us in the United States that are doing this horrible stuff. And so it felt like the film was kind of doing that as well. Like, look at all the brutality that is happening by people of color. Look how horrible they treat these dogs and cats. There's footage of dogs and cats and and crates being kicked over. They really dwell on that. And, of course, the fish being eaten alive. And, you know, I know they want to get people on board and be like, I care about dogs and cats, so I should care about this. Um, But it it, it just felt like it kind of just really stuck out at me that – uh, that the, they really dwelled on those things and it just didn't feel proportionate at all to me. Yeah, I, I was actually also going to bring up the like the dogs and cats because as soon as that came on, I was like, oh, people are gonna people are gonna watch this and say, oh, those people over there are so terrible. Yeah. Uh, but and and I don't maybe you disagree. I'm not sure, but to me, and it's especially I started thinking about this after they showed the scene with the dogs and cats. Um, I, I was worried. I was like, I don't know if the direct. Do you know if the director, if the director is American? You know, I am not sure 
I think he is, but let's look it up. Because maybe he's not, but I thought that it there wasn't enough. And again, I guess this movie is not supposed to be just for Americans. Yeah. But I didn't think there was enough of uh, being in America. I didn't think that, w- that there was enough about America. Like, they showed a lot of, um, like, racism in America from, like, a, c- a couple decades ago or many decades ago. But I think someone watching this that might not – that might still be a little racist or a lot racist – like, they are going to easily make the argument, oh, well, that was three decades ago, and racism is over, and we're fine now. Like, I didn't think, um, because they did show a lot of contemporary video footage, and they didn't really show any that had to do with racism, I thought, in the, like, in the U.S. Like, they showed a lot of, um, like, Martin Luther King Jr. and stuff like that. But again, if I was white and I thought that racism was over, I could just watch this movie and say, oh, well... Racism ended with Martin Luther King in America, and I don't need to worry about that. So I was worried that they weren't they weren't exposing some of the the tragedies that happen in America. Enough. Yeah, and to be clear, you are white. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, because um, you said if I was white, but oh, sorry, I meant yeah, to say I know like, you're it, saying yeah. just just for the listeners. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, I meant sorry, I meant to say like, um, and I'm totally not saying I'm like the perfect white ally or anything like that but um i know there's ways that i need to improve but if i was of the the thought that that racism didn't exist in america being white um if i thought that then i could watch this movie and easily shrug it off as saying all these problems are happening elsewhere yeah thank you for catching me on that yeah (laughs) Yeah, i wasn't trying to like call you out i just wanted to make sure the viewers were or the listeners uh weren't confused on that um yeah and that's another thing is they sort of hit all these sort of um traditional milestones of like here's some quotes from martin luther king here's some gandhi Mm -hmm. And it's a thing that you see animal advocates doing all the time and sort of repurposing or appropriating quotes from these other, um, you know, civil rights leaders uh, for animals. Mm-hmm. And, you know, many people do find that problematic. So that was like consistent throughout the whole film was that happening. Um, a little thing that I noticed was in the beginning, they, they reflect a little bit on American culture or maybe culture in general. And they talk about like... Um, greed and ego and when they're talking about that it was all footage of uh, hip hop artists and when they said ego they ended on a shot of Kanye West and it was like come on like you can do better than that like it it was just like ugh and um, see the other thing that I wrote down was that there's a section where they're showing armies from all over the world this is actually one of the times when they didn't have uh, narrators going I think (laughs) And they're like, oh, this is the army of Germany. This is the army of Japan. This is the army of the United States. And then they just said armies of Africa. Yeah, I noticed that. And I I was like, I reserved judgment. I was like, I'm going to go home and look up and see if there is an armies of Africa or something. Yeah. But it's like, no, they named all these specific countries and then they just lumped Africa into this one continent. And it's like. What? Like, you could just name, like, you know... Just one of the country, <laughs> one of the armies. Yes. It was just like, oh, what are you What are you doing? This is, like, so ridiculous. Um, Which and, is a bummer, because I thought that was a... I thought that was a powerful, powerful scene. Yeah. Yeah, so it was just like, oh, and uh, and also Africa, I guess. <laughs> I guess this gigantic continent with, like, uh, re- you know, a huge amount of countries. Uh, I, I, we're just going to lump you all into one. Yeah. And it's just like... Um, when I was just quickly Googling to see if there was armies of Africa yeah. uh, and make sure I wasn't jumping the gun. It's like, I found an article that was, you know, the 10 African countries with the highest military strength and firepower. So it's like, it's not like they just had three people, three, you know, groups to pick from. And they're like, okay, let's just put them all in there and label them under yeah. Africa or something. Yeah. And so that was like another thing. I was like, uh, I j- it just, you know, feels like they're not handling this with enough ease. And if it was one or two of these little things, but it's like all of these things put together and so, you know, in the, the beginning of the film, there's that um, qualifier that's like, you know, we want to thank all the narrators for contributing their time, even if they don't necessarily agree with every section of the film. The ideas presented are solely that of the creator, you know, Sean Monson. Um, so it's like, okay, it's coming from this person who is a white man uh, born in America. Um, but at the same time, 
if it was just like one narrator, it's like you could maybe excuse or it wouldn't seem as obvious how white it was. But when it was just all these white, mostly actors and actresses kind of yeah. popping up, um, it, it was just so apparent that it's like, here's a bunch of white people telling all these other people like, Hey, we're all the same. And we just got to be like peaceful man. Yeah. And, uh, mixed in with all this just new age mumbo jumbo. <laughs> and that, that's another thing about the perception of someone who hadn't been exposed to this. It just felt like a long YouTube video that someone put together <laughs> and, and was like, I can find some video clips and I can throw some narration on there. And, you know, it was just like an elevated video cause they had all these celebrity narrators, yeah. but it, it just like totally lost me. Like I was like, this is all just meaningless jargon. Yeah. There was also some clips that I was like, <laughs> I, I was almost like, come on. It was like such stock, fo- like such not stock footage, but it was such like classic pictures or clips that I was like, you, you, you can do better than you can do better than this. Like the scene of the after they were showing bombs blowing up and there was the scene of like all the trees getting getting pushed. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that was in <laughs> Mad Max. I saw that. I, I'm almost positive that would that clip was in Mad Max and like every other movie that, yeah. that is talking about like an, like an atom bomb being dropped or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, and also <clears throat> to harp on the, uh, the presentation of race because the film seemed to only, the only time it ever had a true focus was when it was talking about animal issues. That's the only time it really presented like some concrete facts mm-hmm. and ideas, even if they were kind of wishy washy, it makes it feel even more like the other footage of civil rights marches and lynchings and, and all these horrific things that happen. It just felt even more like someone that was using those things to prop up this idea. It yeah. felt like this film was kind of trying to be a Trojan horse for getting animal rights into people's consciousness and view because it never really handled everything else with the same gravity. Even mm-hmm. when it was doing the war is bad stuff, it was just very like, what are we going to do? Are we going to let these people represent us, man? Like <laughs> just the most basic stuff. And it felt like they never zeroed in on it. So it just felt like it was like, okay, I guess we got to throw this in. We got to throw a little thing on racism in, and we got to throw some war stuff in. And that's really just there. So we can sneak in this animal rights stuff. Yeah. And, and that kind of made it even feel a little more offensive that they were using that footage in and not giving it the proper gravity that it deserved. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's not something that I thought of, but looking back on it, that's that's definitely true. The only thing that they they really talked specifically about was the few things like the the dairy farming and the dairy farm. <laughs> yeah, dairy farming and arteries, and oh my oh, god, yeah. there was so much footage of surgery. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just like liposuction and, yeah. and like quadruple bypass stuff or whatever. They really harped on that a yeah. lot, and and it's like weird that. That I feel like if that was what the not the not the the uh, surgery footage, but the specifics, if they had talked about that, like um, in other in other sections of the movie, like with race, then it would have been a much better movie. Um, I mean, the one thing they, the one thing I also thought that was good, that was powerful, was when they showed the list of um, like all the different wars since. I think like 1910 and how many people died in each war like that I thought was powerful. And again, it's like, that was something that like, it was something different than what I've seen. I've seen, unfortunately I've seen like images of war before. So it's like just seeing them again, it invokes rage within me, but it's not gonna like, then I'm like, okay, what do I need to do about this? And it's like, nothing, we got nothing for you. Yeah, and I think war feels like this big abstract idea that's, you know, I've I've attended my share of, you know, anti-war rallies and whatnot, but it always kind of feels like this thing that we we can't do anything about, like we can, and obviously people do stuff about it, but it just feels like this huge abstract concept. Um, So, and I, I think that when actually I had the opposite reaction when they were doing the little scroll of the numbers of people dead in various wars. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, the whole, the death of one man is a tragedy, death of a million is a statistic, whatever. Um, that whole saying, uh, I think Stalin actually said that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but regardless, it just felt like, oh, here's a bunch of numbers of people that died. Hmm. And it kind of, it took away from the impact. Like, it was, it was hard to see those huge numbers and like, oh, three, eight, three million here, eight million here, whatever. Um, but it, to me, it was just like, here's a bunch of numbers. Um, and also I felt like the production value, like some of the fonts they were choosing <laughs> yeah. was like real, especially the, the whole, 
uh, opening cosmos thing. It just didn't have high production value. Yeah. Like you're watching it and you're like, this is kind of a cheap thing. And it's like, you can't blame anyone for having low budget and doing the best they can. But at the same time, why highlight that? Why make that a central thing? And why make that the first large section yeah. of your film yeah. when it just looks like something that like some local planetarium would put together or they'd put together something better, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, did you, uh, were there any pros to the movie? Did you, what was, what was at least one thing that you thought was besides, we already talked about the scene with the, the fish and the scene with the cows in the beginning and the, and the end, but was there anything else that stuck out to you or was powerful or moving? I really like hearing Jeff Goldblum's voice, <laughs> which was for like one line. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I honestly could not recommend the film to anyone. I felt like it was a waste of my time and it, I'm gravely disappointed to see seven years of work amount to that. And, yeah. um, it, it's, it's really hard to, to give this review because it's really disappointing to me. And I was really rooting for this film, but, uh, I, I, don't have anything positive to say about it. I'd, if I was to talk about, you know, make a list of my favorite animal rights documentaries or films, this would certainly be pretty far down on the bottom, if not on mm. the bottom. So uh, I, I hate to be a hater, but yeah. I, I am. Uh, how about yourself? Was there anything that you did enjoy about the film? Um, I did like, and you may disagree with me with this. I did like the part at the very end when they flashed, they kept flashing like the two words and it was talking about like the duality of things. And it would say like Christianity, Islam, and like animal, human, and carnivore, carnivore vegan. Yeah, carnivore, whatever. plant eater, whatever. And, um, and it was just going so fast and they were just like throwing so many images at you. Maybe that was why that was part of it. But I was very moved by that part. I almost, that was the one part that I almost started to cry. So, so you're saying your problem with the film was that it either, it didn't move too fast. <laughs> it was always like in this weird two second clip. And if they had done it really fast or way slower, it would have been better. Well, no, no, definitely not. But this, like, just having that one part, like, and it, and it went on for a pretty long time, too. Yeah. For, for having clips that were a fraction of a second each, yeah. it went on for a pretty long time. And I thought that that part was very powerful because, um, to me, I think that that, what I, what I got from that scene was what I felt that the whole movie was trying, was trying to do, was it was trying to say, like, like we are so many different people, but in the end, like there is something that's there is something that is connecting us all. Um, yeah. And and like even including like the duality of meat eater versus vegan, even though they were like they were um, like trashing eating meat, they were promoting veganism before previously in the movie. It's like they're still including, they're still acknowledging that this person exists and this person still deserves like the same rights that everyone else deserves. So I, that's what I took from that scene. And I think that that, that hit me hard. Um, uh, but I think it, maybe it was just my interpretation of it. Maybe the actual scene wasn't that good, but what I took from it was, was pretty powerful. I think that was my, that was my favorite part of the, the movie. Um, favorite part in a, a mess <laughs> of things that I didn't really like. So, yeah, but yeah, that, I, that part, I didn't feel strongly either way. I guess it just kind of washed over yeah. me at that. At that point, I felt like I was just bubbling with rage that had sat <laughs> through that. So I was just yeah. kind of like waiting for it to be over. Yeah. Um, and I, I should mention we were in a theater with about, from my count, fifty people. Might have been a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And um, my friend Amanda in a theater in Tampa said there was only ten people there. Yikes. So it got you know, at least in our theater a pretty decent turnout because this film is getting a, well, a, a limited wide release. I don't know if that's like a correct term, but basically mm -hmm. it was in a ton of theaters. I think it was in eight different theaters in Connecticut. Yeah. Uh, but all for this, this one seven o'clock showing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, who knows how many people saw it, but uh, as, as we were walking out, uh, I saw two people that were at compassion fest and they were both just, they, they looked very disappointed <laughs> and, uh, you know, one person was like, that was not, you know, what I was expecting. Yeah. And it felt like it, they said something like it didn't really feel like it knew what it was doing. And, you know, that's all I caught from just walking by. Um, and, you know, it, it's kind of new, so it doesn't really have a lot of reviews online or anything. But on, on Rotten Tomatoes, uh, which is, you know, a site that aggregates all the, all the reviews together mm -hmm. and gives it a percentage, um, there's not enough 
critic reviews for a percentage, but the user review is at 25% right now. Um, and, and one person who gave it one star said, pretty sad to see the strong arguments for animal rights lost amongst a lot of new age woo. Uh, the film had good intentions, but filled with cringeworthy, cringeworthy and meaningless pseudo logic. Um, so I feel like, you know, it seems like that's probably gonna be the general reception from people, which, you know, it's, it's just disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any, um, I feel like we've dissected this pretty well. <laughs> At this point, we're just kind of hitting it while it's down. Yeah, I know. Seriously. <laughs> uh, this film is the fish that has been fried alive <laughs> oh, and no. cut up. And now we're just taking little pieces out like, of it. Like I really, I feel like, like, I feel like it's the same with you. I feel bad talking about it in this way, but it's like, it was not that good. It was yeah. not that good. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's important, and this is something that carries over in a lot of aspects of veganism and animal rights, is that we need to be critical of the things within our movement. Just like, you know, I find that a lot of people, if they just have, like, the one vegan place in their town, if it's not that great, they're still going to speak highly of it because mm-hmm. they, they want people to go there, they want people to eat the vegan food, they want to do well. But it's like... If the food sucks, don't give it a good review. <laughs> if the movie's not good, don't give yeah. it a good review because, you know, we we don't need to praise mediocrity. We, you know, the animals deserve the best films that we can make, the best food that we can make, the best t-shirts we can make. <laughs> you know, uh, they deserve the best because, you know, they're, you know, victims and, you know, it's up to us that are to be their advocates and do the best we can for them. Hey everyone, this is Paul of The Bearded Vegans. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that The Bearded Vegans is part of the Commentist Network and you can find us on iTunes and Stitcher. And uh, I would encourage you to learn more about the show at thecommentist.com. That's T-H-E-C-O-M-M-E-N-T-I-S-T dot com. Uh, We also have a lot of other great shows on The Commentist Network. I do two other shows. Uh, One of them is called Continuous Improvement. That's just a kind of general positivity podcast and then i do one uh with my brother and some of my other friends called roll to hit which is a dungeons and dragons podcast so yeah please check all those out uh thanks for listening again and let's get back to the show before we uh finish up andy is there any like what what movies would you recommend because um i think there are a lot of great movies out there i think you've seen more than me so i'll, I'll hand this over to you Sure. Well, I think you should add a few if you if All you right. feel. Um, you know, I already mentioned Cowspiracy. I think that's a really strong film, and that just has such a great narrative arc, and it's fun to follow along. And it's kind of this mystery: why is this being suppressed? Following the journey of the uh, the director or the um, the narrator, the, the star. It's kind of like a, <laughs> it's kind of like how Michael Moore is the director and also the star of his yeah. films. You're kind of following him. It's like that. And uh, I think that's really good. I think Forks Over Knives is very powerful, especially for certain crowds where you're sort mm-hmm. of going at it from the health angle. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that Forks Over Knives is a really good supplemental piece to something that's talking about the ethics. So, like I said, I combined Earthlings with Forks mm-hmm. Over Knives. Um, I really love the film Peaceable Kingdom. Have you seen that one? I haven't heard of it, I don't think. It's, um, you know, it came out a long time ago, and then the the directors sort of redid it. They took out some pieces. Um, but it sort of, it goes at it from an angle that's not really super common. And I guess I would add that to my, you know, triple billing of Earthlings and Forks Over Knives and Cowspiracy. I would put Peaceable Kingdom in there, and it talks about the emotional lives of animals, and mm. it, it follows or interviews and explores the stories of several farm sanctuary owners and, and people who, you know, had an operation where they were like raising goats and then decided to, you know, raising goats for slaughter and milk mm-hmm. and stuff and then decided to turn it into a sanctuary <laughs> and it explores like the bonds between animals. And there's definitely some cheer jerker moments there. That's cool. Um, you know, just this one moment where a, a mother sheep is reunited with her, her baby and she's waiting for truckload of truckload of these little lambs to come off waiting for her child. And it's very sad. And then of course they're reunited and it's glorious. So, oh. Um, I would I would highly recommend Peaceable Kingdom. Uh, cool. the, as soon as I saw it, I immediately ordered a copy for both my parents and for my sister and sent them right to them. So nice. Um, I think those would probably be you know my top ones. There's probably a few that I'm forgetting, but I think those ones are the the most impactful. Hmm. Yeah, I I'd, whenever people ask me about it, I I just say Earthlings and Forks Over Knives for the same reason that Forks Over Knives it, it attacks it from a from a different perspective that at least gets people thinking about it if they're not totally on board with the like the animal advocacy 
portion of veganism, then you get them on board with health and then hit them with earthlings later on. Uh, <laughs> I, I like to go the reverse because I feel like there's the fork serving eyes is like way more up, 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 uplifting. Yeah. Um, and especially, you know, what I was talking about, how like documentaries need that final, like, here's the great music and everyone's happy and this is what we're doing and we're living healthy and all that stuff. Fork serving eyes does that so well and it just gets you so pumped up on, you know, eating plant based food. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and then there's also that video that I see on on Facebook every once in a while. It's called like Meet Your Meat. Is that a PETA video, possibly? That is. That's like the granddaddy PETA video, I believe. But it's good because it's like it's like twenty, fifteen, twenty minutes. It's short. It's graphic, and it like it's graphic like, as hell. And it's like, <laughs> but it's like here's like. Oh, you like eating chickens? Here's your chickens. Oh, you like eating bacon? Here's your here's your pigs. Oh, you like eating hamburgers? Here's your uh, cows. And it's kind of like boom, boom, boom. And then you're like, hold. It's like a a whirlwind of of this shit. And then you're like, then it's over. And you're like, all right, I gotta stop eating this stuff. Yeah. So, so I think that's good. Yeah, it's kind of like an abbreviated um, Earthlings, basically. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because Earthlings yeah. is like that. That movie really beats you down. <laughs> Um, and actually, since we're talking about films and, and what I think are uh, effective, um, Farm Animal Rights Movement just put out a three-minute video called Have We Been Lied To? So it's sort of the video version of their leaflet, Have We Been Lied To? Hmm. And it's all animated, so it's not graphic, but it is incredibly well done. It just came out, and it's been getting a lot of um, publicity. I know... Uh, Tony from No Doubt, who is also a narrator yeah. in this film, one for like one line, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, he, he like retweeted it, and like a lot of celebrities are kind of getting behind it, and it's good because it's sort of it's a good primer, and it's a film that can then be shown in areas where graphic footage is not allowed to be mm-hmm. shown. So if you just go on YouTube and look up "Have We Been Lied To," that um, you know you'll be able to find that and check it out. I think it's going to be a really good tool for getting the message into certain places that previously. Uh, we've been unable to get it into. Cool. I'm going to look it up right after this podcast. All right. Okay. Well, I think that about wraps it up. I don't know how long that was, but probably a good 35, 40 <laughs> minutes. Um, unfortunately, I've just <laughs> given it to <laughs> to Unity. Yeah. But, um, you a know. to be said. Yeah. A lot to be said about the film. And I'm... You know, this is all, we literally just saw the film and came straight here. <laughs> and as Paul said, we didn't talk about it. We, we were actually in separate cars because I was coming from somewhere else. So we just like hit record and started talking about it. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more deep critique to be made of the mm-hmm. film. And maybe some things we overlooked that maybe we should like about it. Yeah. That will hopefully emerge in you know the coming weeks and months. And I'll, I'll certainly be really interested. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that we missed. Mm-hmm. Um, from a critical and from a positive angle, uh, especially from a critical angle. But yeah, so feel free to, to email us again. Our email is thebeardedvegans at gmail dot com, um, and or just leave message a message on the on iTunes or Stitcher. And uh, can you respond on Stitcher? Is that a thing? Uh, you can't respond on Stitcher. Okay, then <laughs> leave it on iTunes or send it to us or send it to us in email because. Um, Again, even if you completely disagreed with us, we'd we'd love to hear your points on it as well. Absolutely. Or you can call 1-800-THE-BEARDED-VEGANS and (laughs) leave an angry voicemail if you want. All right, so thank you so much again for listening. Again, our email is thebeardedvegans at gmail.com. You can find all our previous episodes on The Commentist Network at thecommentist.com. And yeah, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. Vegetables, fresh fruit, and whole wheat. I'm from the old school. My household smell like soul food, bruh. Curry falafel.